after yesterday's bombing. Now that sparked suspicion. Officials talked to him, then they released him, but they took him back into custody after Italian authorities and FBI agents searched his bags during a stopover in Rome. They found non-explosive materials that could be used in bomb making. He's now en route back to the States with federal agents. Now two federal agencies, the FBI and the Justice Department, are holding separate news conferences on their findings this afternoon. The FBI has arrest warrants out on those two men, we, those two white men we showed you pictures of. They're known as John Doe's at this point, and all we know is that they're considered white males. No further information is available about them at all. If there's a chance that they're still in the country and authorities believe that there's a, there's a chance they are, um, there's a hotline number you can call. You can call this number, 1-800-905-1514. All right, David, thank you. Roy. Well, the search for survivors is suspended for a time as crews work to stabilize the crumbling building in Oklahoma City. News Channel 5, Deborah Lee is following developments from that city and joins us now from our satellite control center with more. Where, where does the toll now, Deb, stand? Roy, 36 dead, 12 of them are children. We also have more than 400 people injured and nearly 200 still missing. And it's for those 200 people that rescue workers continue to hold out hope. You know, it's a very slow, tedious process of removing the debris and extricating the fatalities and searching for survivors. You know, you hope and you pray that every time you turn a stone, there'll be a survivor somewhere. Survivors doctors fear could be suffering from hypothermia. Rescue workers use dogs, listening devices, and small cameras to look for any signs of life in these ruins, a job which could take four to six more days. Healing the emotional scars will take even longer, especially for federal employees. The realization didn't hit me until the explosion yesterday that my job could possibly cost my child her life. Of the 36 fatalities, 12 are children who were at a daycare center in the building. Security is beefed up at thousands of federal buildings throughout the nation as President Clinton tried, promises swift justice for those punished. responsible. We will never let the forces of inhumanity prevail. And the president also today ordered flags to be flown around the nation at half-staff in memory of those victims. Roy? All right, Deb, thank you. Lorna? An Akron area woman still doesn't know the fate of her loved one in Oklahoma City. News Channel 5's Kathy Davis joins us now from our 24-hour newsroom. And Kathy, I understand she is heading to Oklahoma City to find her missing relative. That's right, Lorna. Teresa Tomlin and the rest of her family are relying on each other's love to give them the courage they need to get through the days ahead. This morning, she boarded a flight to head to Oklahoma to find out what happened to her brother. My brother's still missing, um, and I know that they're supposed to start identifying the bodies this morning. So my dad's down there, mom's down there, my sister's on her way, other relatives are coming in. Teresa Tomlin also booked a flight here at Hopkins Airport after finding out that her brother was missing. They know he was in the building when the explosion happened because his wife was on the phone with him. But Teresa says she's not quite sure she wants to find out what she may find out once she gets to Oklahoma. I kind of want to go see the building, but then I don't want to go see the building. So I don't know what we're going to do. That one! Where are we flying to? And Teresa and her husband don't know how they're going to explain what they're doing to their two-year-old son, Carl. Carl's just excited about going on a plane trip. To say Oklahoma? A trip to a state that, until yesterday, was like Carl, the ultimate in innocence. But now, everything's changed for this family and the nation. Okay. We've not yet heard back from Teresa Tomlin. We're hoping to hear some good news from her. Well, Kathy, what about the hospital list of the dead and injured? Well, Lorna, we have been checking them. So far, Rick Tomlin's name does not appear, and hopefully that is a good sign. I hope so. All right, Kathy Davis from our newsroom. Thank you. Whoever made an overnight phone call to the Lake County Courthouse will be in big trouble if he's caught. It was a bomb scare left on an answering machine at the courthouse in Painesville at 1.41 this morning. A custodian heard the message when she came to work at 6 a.m. I heard this machine telling me that there's a, three bombs in the courthouse and they're going to go off at 10 o'clock. If I would please evacuate the building because they don't want to hurt anybody. 
Well, the courthouse was evacuated this morning while experts searched for a bomb. They did not find one. It's a felony, by the way, to make such a call. Authorities are also taking no chances here at Cleveland's federal building. Security has tightened and guards at the building are more visible. News Channel 5's Roosevelt Leftwich has been talking with workers and joins us now with more. And Rosie, how concerned are folks about their safety? Well, Lorna, a lot depends on who you talk to here. A lot of folks say it's basically scary to them to think that the only crime that the people in Oklahoma may have committed was the fact that they showed up for work that morning. Workers here say they're saddened by the tragedy here at the Cleveland Federal Building, but they say that they won't stop working. It is a sign of respect for the fallen. It is also an uncomfortable reminder of a world where the innocent become victims of extremists. Many federal workers didn't quite realize the scope of the bombing in Oklahoma City until they got home and saw the pictures on TV like this. I'm afraid. I really am. I came in here this morning. I was frightened. Um, I'm just afraid of what might happen because there are so many terrorists out there. You but just you... don't know. I'm more nervous and, you know, because of what happened in Oklahoma, of course. Well, you're nervous because what? Worried just... that it may happen here. You never know when it may happen. You never know, really. A lot of folks wanted it to be business as usual, but there were just too many reminders. Security was tight on the outside and on the inside as guards searched every bag coming into the building. One woman told us off camera that the daycare center wasn't that crowded today, mainly because of spring breaks, but partly because many parents just aren't sure. But no matter how they feel about this tragedy, many federal workers say they have to keep on going. I'm sure there's some concern there, but you can't let it affect you. If you worry about it, you won't come to work and you'll drive yourself nuts. <laughs> There's a lot of conversation going on about the situation, which was really a tragedy, and I hate that something like that had happened. So all of us need to pray, and hopefully uh, things will get better. Now, Lorna, in general, federal offices here in Cleveland and all around the nation are going to be taking a closer look at their security in light of what happened in Oklahoma City. Well, Rosie, what about other federal facilities here in Cleveland? Well, it was, as with most federal facilities, you need some kind of ID to get in. The federal courts especially are very tight because of some of the cases they have there. It's sort of like, it's not, everybody is sort of like has a heightened sense that there is danger out there and that you need to be ready for it. All right, Roosevelt Leftwich reporting live. Thanks, Roy. Well, here's a recap of the latest developments in yesterday's explosion at the federal building in Oklahoma City. So far, the death toll from the blast has reached 36, 12 of them children. The number is expected to climb. More than 400 people were injured in the explosion, and the FBI has issued arrest warrants for two men. Our team coverage of the Oklahoma explosion will continue tonight. Coming up at 520, we'll speak with an expert who helps people deal with tragedy like the one in Oklahoma City. Then at 540, we'll go live to Washington, D.C. for the latest on what's being discussed inside the White House. And then at 6 tonight, a local school is running a campaign to help some of the victims of the blast. The idea comes from an 8-year-old girl. But coming up next, we'll look at some of the other news in the area, including this bus accident on the East Shoreway. For nearly 100 kids from an eerie Pennsylvania suburb, it was supposed to be a fun day in Cleveland. But as News Channel 5's Alan DiPietro tells us, the trip wound up on the shoreway east in disappointment and near disaster. There they were, mostly 12-year-old kids, crying, crestfallen, sobbing, shaking. They survived a close call when their three tour buses, two cars, and two semi-trucks somehow got tangled up westbound shortly before 10 this morning. Perhaps a bus driver could explain. What happened, you please tell us? No comment. Our bus driver tried to avoid it, but he couldn't. All of a sudden, I just heard the, somebody slam on the brakes. It was just one big chain reaction. A couple of them got out through the window because it was all smashed. I was a car behind the cargo van. The bus hit me and pushed me into the cargo van. That was former Browns running back Greg Pruitt. His car was nearly sandwiched between two of the buses. He was taken to hospital. So were 27 students. Bumps and bruises mostly. Uh, there was a few that uh, may have been hurt worse than the others, but it, it seems to be mostly bumps and bruises. It was not a good morning on the shoreway east as frustrated, full of energy kids waited and waited. Motorists who were backed up many a mile waited and waited. The kids from the Iroquois School District who had worked and begged for money for months to take this trip were taken to the Fire Training Academy, 
where some discovered that all's well that ends well. The best thing about today, you brought $38 with you, right? Yep. How much are you going home with? $38. Parents and teachers alike said they'll soon return for the rainforest and a little less excitement on the highway. Alan DiPietro, News Channel 5. All 27 students and three adults, including ex-Brown Greg Pruitt, were treated and released from Metro and Mount Sinai Medical Centers. Well, there was severe weather moving through Texas last night. Severe funnel clouds were reported, and at least two tornadoes touched down the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The winds were so strong that brick facings blew off apartment buildings and cars flipped over. Nobody was seriously hurt, amazingly enough, by that nasty weather, which uh, I'm sure hampered the uh, search for survivors in Oklahoma City. Right. Yeah, that's for right. A while. And I guess little remnants of that are headed this way at least. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, nothing as severe as that. We might get a thunderstorm tonight. A little bit of shower activity. But I know that spring has sprung. How do you, How know? Do you know? Because I mowed my lawn today. Uh, yeah. Mowed crabgrass. <laughs> oh, it's pretty good. It's, pretty it's, pretty good. it's good. off to a pretty good start. I also noticed that rabbits have been feasting on my tulips again. I wonder why the <laughs> tulips weren't there. Oh, yeah, they do it every <laughs> year. Deer, they I just grow them to feed rabbits. <laughs> All right, let's have a look down, find out where this rain is, what's going to be affecting us over the next 24 to 48 hours. And over the greater Cleveland area, we have had uh, one band of light showers move through. Uh, right now, nothing too much is happening. It's uh, relatively dry out there, but more rain is uh, quite likely to affect us a little bit later on tonight and uh, uh, on into the first part of tomorrow in the form of some showers and possibly a thunder bumper from time to time. Okay, let's uh, check down and find out uh, what we have around the state. Well, we have 46 degrees in Cleveland. Lake Erie water temperature is 43. Mansfield is 49. Columbus is 56. Considerably cooler than it was yesterday, with one exception. That is Cincinnati. Look at that. They're still coming in at a very pleasant 70. And uh, this is our forecast now. Showers and thunderstorms later this afternoon and tonight. Winds out of the east coming to the south at 10 to 20 miles an hour. And our low temperature tonight will be 50 degrees. Sunrise time in the morning, 639. Looking ahead to tomorrow, some early showers, then becoming partly cloudy. We should be in for a very nice afternoon and evening, really. Winds out of the south coming to the west, kind of breezy at 15 to 25, but that's usual for this time of year. Look at that for a high temperature. If we keep our fingers crossed, I think we'll just touch 70 degrees. That certainly is more like it. Sunset time, 13 minutes after 8 o'clock. All right, let's have a look now at our weather school question for the day. Ah, uh, this is a tough cool. one. Grief right. looks like a textbook. <laughs> okay, on the average, the country with the most days of thunderstorms annually is... And do you know what they did? They put the answers up right there. So we'll just talk about this for a minute. I think it's okay. B. All right, yeah. Pick B and you've got it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but... Uh, that's it. B. Okay. And you know, that was so complicated that for the answer, I had written down these things in big letters so that yeah. I could sit here and read and pretend that I knew everything that was going on. We know. You know, there it is. All the right. question Maybe. and the answer all in one. Maybe you can punch up another one for the second half hour. Oh, it's okay. Uh, no, you got it. I'm, I'm getting hooked on this. Go out a winner. You won. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, the destruction in Oklahoma City continues to shock everyone in the country. Coming up next, we'll talk with a psychologist who works with victims of disaster. Many years ago, an operation for breast cancer was developed in which all of the breast was removed, as well as much of the muscle of the chest wall. For the last 25 years, there has been a movement toward doing less radical surgery and preserving the breast as much as possible while also preserving the patient's life. Commonly today, patients need only a lumpectomy followed by radiation therapy. The New England Journal of Medicine now reports in a 10-year follow-up of patients treated by either the radical method or the breast preserving method, the survival rate of the two groups of patients is the same. This good news means more women will now be spared disfiguring surgery. I'm medical editor Dr. Ted Costell with your medical moment. Now for the latest developments on the Oklahoma City blast, let's go live to the scene where reporter Judy Fortin is standing by. Judy, what's the latest? Well, Roy, the FBI may be on its way to solving the car bombing here in Oklahoma City. They've issued arrest warrants for two white men, and they say that they have identified a car that is involved. They say it's a rental truck uh, that may have been parked in front of the building, and they expect uh, that at least 1,200 pounds or the equivalent of 1,200 pounds of TNT was in that vehicle. They had said yesterday, and they reiterated today, that they believe that bomb was made up of fertilizer and fuel oil. Now, they haven't uh, identified 
identified the suspects by name. They've only given out descriptions saying they are two white men of medium build. One of the gentlemen has a tattoo, uh, but they do believe these men uh, were involved. And uh, today the FBI didn't say anything about uh, another uh, uh, suspect or alleged suspect in this case. Apparently a Jordanian American man was detained uh, at a London airport and uh, he is being brought back to an undisclosed location. Sources are saying he may be a witness or a suspect in this case. So that's where it stands right now. In terms of the rescue efforts, it's been sus suspended for a couple of hours now while they shore up the building. We can show you the live picture uh, right behind us. You can see there's a, a crane that's been in front of the building uh, now since last night, actually. And they've been lowering engineers and firemen by a bucket. They have been going through each of the nine floors checking to see how sound the building is and how safe it is to see if rescue crews uh, may be able to get in there and try to find uh, anyone who may have survived this terrible disaster. The last time someone was pulled out alive was about 20 hours ago. It was a 15-year-old girl. We understand she is hospitalized and fighting for her life at this hour. I'm Judy Fortin reporting live in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Roy, back to you. Judy, just off to our left, your right, I thought I saw some movement up there. Is there actually anybody up there searching now or do you know? Well, actually, uh, we understand they are structural experts who are trying to shore up the building. They want to make sure the rescue crews don't get injured or killed. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation in the building right now. There's rubble just piled on top of rubble, and they want to be careful that no one else gets hurt, Roy. I assume some of that building is easier to get at than, than other parts of it. What's, what's likely to be the last place that's searched? Well, the bottom floors, we understand, are literally pancaked together. That's where that daycare center was located, as well as uh, some other very busy offices. They have yet, uh, we believe, to get to some of those floors. Yeah. Uh, right now, they can uh, have better access to the top floors. But like I said, it's been suspended for a while so they can make sure it's safe. Attorney General uh, uh, Reno was not going to comment on those two s suspects that we saw, the pictures that we saw. Is anybody there saying anything? I mean, you know, you hear a lot of talk. Are they talking about who these two guys might be? Well, they don't. They haven't identified the people by name. Uh, one interesting point: they didn't rule out any motives, including revenge, at this point. Uh, so that's been an interesting aspect this afternoon. They say there have been no arrests and no other suspects that they know of, but they have issued arrest warrants for these two white men. They're saying they're armed and dangerous, and people shouldn't try to apprehend them if they do recognize them from the composite sketches. All right, Roy? Judy. Thanks very much, Judy Fortin, live in Oklahoma City. Now let's go over to Lorna. Thanks, Roy. Well, the effects of the bombing in Oklahoma City will stay with us long after the area has cleared. Dr. Donald Friedheim is the chairman of the Mental Health Committee of the American Red Cross. He's also an associate professor of psychology at Case Western Reserve University. And he joins us today with insight on the psychological ramifications of yesterday's destruction. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Now, because of your work with the Red Cross, you've worked with disaster victims before. What are some of your thoughts on the situation in Oklahoma City? Well, this was a horrible trauma. And when you have a trauma like this, it has a, a very profound effect on those that are involved. and also has a ripple effect. It has a ripple effect for all of us who, you know, can imagine this kind of incident happening and can feel very empathetic with the victims in Oklahoma City. And one of those ripple effects you spoke of, the effect on children, obviously that's a very big concern. What can we do to try to reassure them, to try to ease some of their fears? I think it's very important for parents to know that their children's stress and anxiety will be very much dependent on their reaction, particularly young children before, below uh, eight and nine years of age. So it's the way parents react that will guide the way ch children react. If the parents are upset and anxious about it, it'll, the, the children will be also. Will so they've got to reassure the children. The children are going to see this on television. They're going to hear it about their friends, you know, from their friends. And they've got to be reassuring that, that they're safe, that they're uh, you know, very secure in, in their environment and that these things do happen, you know, they happen in, in small scale in Cleveland all the time, right. they happen in its larger scale once in a while, but uh, help the children deal with the stress that they're going to feel because they will see children brought out of the wreckage, we've seen that, they'll know that uh, there were children who were killed in this kind of incident. And what happens when you have this kind of very, very sharp trauma is that everybody gets a little more sensitive to the anxieties that may not even be related to that, but other anxieties in their own lives, other stress in their own lives. So what we've seen in Cleveland, and we're beginning to see this now, is a lot of sensitivity around 
the federal building certainly, around other buildings, around daycare inst inst installations, and um, we all have to have a little perspective to help our children deal with it. Now, what about the um, rescue workers? We heard from them, a lot of them, and many of them have said that they've never seen this type of destruction and very distraught rescue workers yes. um, on the news. How important is it for them to seek help? Well, we found that it's very important. Uh, the rescue workers will see, uh, again, very traumatic, have very traumatic experiences. They'll see bodies, parts of bodies, they'll see people suffering. And what we've learned is that unless they deal with the stress that comes from that, and everyone would have an emotional reaction, unless they deal with it to some extent at that time, it may get buried and then later on appear in what we've called the post-traumatic stress syndrome. And so it's important for them to talk to people, to get out their feelings, to just be able to express to another human being, another person, some of the emotional reactions that they have. And we find that that in itself is very, can be very helpful. Now, would that same thing apply for um, family members who are waiting to hear about their loved ones? Oh, absolutely. We, we are prepared here in Cleveland with our mental health committee and our trauma action team to deal with victims and with families of victims. And the families are important, and also uh, the workers because they're the ones who are not right there where something, you know, their, their action can do much about it. So their feelings uh, and emotions uh, are, are very severe and very difficult. As we wrap up, what about people who are concerned that this is a sign of things to come? Well, I think we have to know that uh, although we do live in a, in a very stressful society with uh, more and more unpredictable things happening, that, uh, you know, it's still a, a pretty safe country to live in. And uh, even if you live, which I did for a year in a country like Israel, where, where they're alerted to this all the time, you can't carry around a feeling of anxiety. You have to be alert and vigilant, but um, people will learn to adapt to, uh, to the fact that these things happen once in a while. But we have to all be careful and watch our own emotions, and if we need to seek help, there's counseling available. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Donald Friedheim from the American Red Cross and Case Western Reserve University. Thanks for coming in. Let's Thank go you. back to Roy. Thanks, Lorna. This weird spring weather continues. Don will tell us what's headed our way for the weekend. A rookie police criminalist is on the stand in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial, and we'll have more on our live team coverage on the Oklahoma City bombing. The latest information when Live on 5 returns. Um, everything went black, and there was a uh, loud noise. So it almost like gunfire and people screaming and I could feel myself being thrown or falling and I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know if it was an earthquake or, or what. I was sitting there reading the paper and just a boom and just remember waking up and crawling out. I mean, just, just trying to wonder if it was really real. I mean, I didn't. It just happened. So, I mean, just heard the boom and then going outside and just seeing everybody running everywhere. It was just kind of pretty crazy. FBI agents are searching for two men they believe were involved in yesterday's bombing in Oklahoma City. News Channel 5's Deborah Lee now joins us from our satellite center with the latest on this. What can you tell us about these two suspects, Deb? Roy, not a lot right now. In fact, the FBI is referring to them as John Doe's because agents don't even know their names yet. We do know that they look something like composite sketches released by the FBI late this afternoon. Two white males, both with medium builds and brown hair. One has a tattoo. And, of course, they are considered armed and dangerous. Agents link them to a rental truck they believe was used in the bombing. There could be any number of motives for it. Uh, it could be the fact that there's some revenge involved here against uh, the federal government as an, as an entity or specifically against one of the agencies housed in that building. But in that case, uh, your, your guess is as good as mine. Now, in addition to all of this, there is another man, we're told, who's being flown back to the United States tonight from London. Uh, he is not being called a suspect, but agents want to question him. They want to talk to him. They're referring to him as a possible witness. Roy? Now, this is what we're hearing about now. I'm sure this investigation is not centering just on these two men in that rental truck. 
Not at all. The uh, special agent in charge of the FBI in Oklahoma says that they have literally hundreds and hundreds of leads that they're following, and they're not going to leave any stone unturned until they solve this case. Mm -hmm. All right, Deb, thanks. Lorna? Well, testimony in the O.J. Simpson trial continued today. Ted Henry joins us now from our 24-hour newsroom with the latest. Hi, Ted. Hi, once again, Lorna. It was a rookie's turn to take the stand earlier today in L.A. Police criminalist Andrea Mazzola testified most of the time that she was collecting blood stains for the case. She was being watched closely by her supervisor, Dennis Fung. When you're at a scene, do you simply just pick up anything and everything that um, happens to be in the area or within a certain diameter of the bodies in the case of a murder? How do you go about making that, that kind of a decision? That, again, is the discretionary area you have to look at the whole scene try to get an idea of what could have happened and start looking for items that could be connected it's better to pick up a little more than not enough meanwhile a dismissed jury member was back in court today michael knox is trying to get a california law thrown out knox is writing a book about his experiences on the panel the book will be ready in may but according to the law in question it cannot be published until a mistrial or verdict has been reached the city of atlanta is bracing itself for a party weekend look at those party animals hundreds of thousands of college kids are expected to spend part of their spring break at the city's freedom festival known as freak nick Last year, more than 200,000 youngsters turned the city into a virtual parking lot. City officials say along with blocking off streets and freeway exits and neighborhoods, police are adding extra officers to patrols to sort of help keep things under control. Okay, ladies. The name of a Lakewood, Colorado teen is about to travel around the world. 13-year-old Christy Millard is an aspiring artist whose work has been tapped to go on a U.S. stamp. Boy, is she something else. Christy's design is one of four winners out of 150,000 entries. Mm -hmm. It's true. The first class stamp is in honor of Earth Day 25th anniversary. This is the first time the U.S. Post Office has ever printed names of ages of artists on a stamp. Hey, listen to this. This is a pretty good deal here. News Channel 5's Bill Shield got a big pat on the back last night, and so did that youngster there. Bill is being honored nationally as a big brother of the year. He was in New York City last night to accept the award. Smiles all the way around, Bill. Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America matches volunteer adults with children who have only one parent who, or who just need a friend. Bill is a good friend to that youngster. If you would like to volunteer, just call your local chapter of Big Brothers or Big Sisters. Had to be a big night for the little youngster there. Way to go, Bill. Lorna, back to you, too. Congratulations, Bill. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ted. You're welcome. As Bill's wife sitting there with him, too, and I know she's involved in the Big they Brothers and the Big yeah. Sisters yeah. thing. And congratulations to both of them. I can't think of anything better. Isn't that how they met? I think they met uh, through that organization. Is that right? Yeah, I hadn't heard yeah, that. That's right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Good for them. Good. Congratulations, Bill. All right, let's see if I can do something right. All right. <laughs> with, with this weather, with a weekend coming up. And uh, first thing we'll do, of course, is check around the country. And down to the south of us, some pretty good thunderstorms have been uh, rumbling around all day up and down the Mississippi River Valley. And uh, some of this is uh, headed up our way. And it looks as though a little bit later on, we'll pick up some showers, maybe some thunderstorms before this whole night is over. On next red Doppler radar right now, nothing too much is happening of any significance. Uh, we've had a little bit of light rain. All that now has moved away. And we don't see anything coming in from the west or from the southwest as yet. However, that is not to say it is not coming because it's, uh, it's getting almost to the Ohio River Valley and uh, from all indications we will be picking up more showers as the night goes along. Around the state now, it's 46 in Cleveland, 49 in Mansfield, 50 in Columbus, down along the uh, River Valley, 55 in Parkersburg, 61 in uh, Huntington, still 70 in Cincinnati, 58 degrees over in Dayton, and Columbus comes in at 56. Lake Erie water temperature is still 43. Showers and thunderstorms, that's our forecast for tonight. Winds out of the east coming around to the south at 10 to 20 with a low temperature of 50 degrees. Sunrise time, 639, and uh, for tomorrow, some early showers. Partly cloudy during the afternoon hours, pretty nice day, breezy day. Winds out of the south coming to the west during the afternoon, 15 to 25, and a high temperature. If we squeeze it out, I think we'll get up to 70 degrees. That's not too bad at all. 13 minutes after 8 o'clock for sunset time. Okay, that's it for the weather. We'll have uh, more at... Uh Oh, about 15 minutes after 6 o'clock. Now back to Roy and Lorna. But where's the weather question? Where's the weather question? We don't, we, you know, we had the question and the answer. Oh, a few it's B. Ago. Yeah. What I'd like to know is, 
You know, a new, How do you person get is do a new person is doing this, and it took you no time at all to get to her, pay her off, and put the question right up. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Congratulations. Okay. Works fast. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Gotta go right out and see it. Yeah, yeah. It's a little unusual. Uh, let's talk about the five-day forecast. Okay, my computer stuck a minute ago. I want to thank you for inviting me back. <laughs> <All right. laughs> You're welcome. And, okay, there it is now. Tomorrow oh, we'll have nice. some showers in the morning oh. and uh, pretty nice during the afternoon, a high of 70. Saturday, 60 and partly cloudy. That looks as though it'll be the best day of the weekend. Sunday, partly cloudy and 55. Monday and Tuesday, sunshine, 55 and 56. So we'll have a little bit of rain tonight and tomorrow morning. And once that's out of here, that's it for the next yeah. few days. So and nice right to have on. you back. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Okay, worth waiting for. Yes. Huh? Thanks, Don. Well, investigators continue to make advances regarding who could be responsible for the Oklahoma City explosion. We'll talk with a terrorism expert when Live on 5 returns. News of suspects continues to trickle in, but officials still have not confirmed who was responsible for yesterday's bombing in Oklahoma City. Terrorism expert Roger Govey joins us with his thoughts on this. Uh, and, Professor, I know I'm asking you to speculate here, but you've been seeing the pictures of these suspects, and maybe you heard some of what the Attorney General had to say a few minutes ago. What's on your mind now? Where do you think this thing may be headed? Well, I hate to disappoint you on that one, Roy, but I don't really want to speculate either. I think uh, there's a, a tremendous danger in, in drawing uh, conclusions way too quickly. We really don't know who did it, and if we uh, assess responsibility incorrectly beforehand, we could hurt some people. I, you know, we, I think we're all victims of stereotypes, and we were expecting to see a couple of Mideast terrorists pop up as suspects, and here's this guy with kind of a Midwestern uh, brush cut. Yes. Yeah, of course, that does not rule out that he may be in, sure. in, in concert with others, but uh, I imagine there are people in the Arab Ameri American community that are feeling at least a little bit of relief. Right. Does it sound to you like, uh, I mean, this, this is starting to sound a little like that situation in New York where it was a rental truck and the, that's the avenue the FBI is taking. That makes sense, I, I assume. It, 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 it does, and it, it looks, there are a lot of similarities. It's not to say that it's exactly the same thing, but when you see similarities like that, you're, you're always drawn to them, and, and of course, that's how the investigation is going to proceed. You're an expert in this field. Did you say to yourself, well, I just wondered when this would happen? I mean, have you been expecting something like this? Well, I sure didn't expect anything in Oklahoma City. But given that terrorism can strike just about anywhere, any place, uh, I'm not terribly surprised about it. No, mm -hmm. it can happen. The fact that it happened in Oklahoma City, does that tell you anything? You really can't tell. It, it, there could be somebody with a very local kind of a problem. Somebody wants revenge against somebody in Oklahoma City. It, it could also be international. Again, we, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Could be a copycat, I suppose, from the, from the New York thing or from other incidents. It's no, th yeah, there's any, there's any number of possibilities. Uh, you know, gee whiz, it, it's almost impossible to, mm -hmm. to narrow anything down at this point. What about the making of this bomb? To those of us who don't know anything about bomb making, thank goodness, this sounds awfully simple to make. Is it that easy? Uh, a lot of bombs are extremely simple to make, and I'm not really a munitions expert either, but this is obviously not a high-tech job here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the heck of it is, uh, you, Janet Reno was, was telling people, they asked her if she was going to ban uh, the ingredients used in the weapon. It would be impossible. It, it's fuel oil. You can't ban something like no. that. Yeah. All right, Professor. Thanks very much for being with us. I you know won't. you're recuperating from a little bit of surgery. And, uh, That's right. This wasn't easy, and I appreciate you doing this. Thanks very much, Roy. Professor Roger Govey uh, with us uh, and his thoughts on uh, the latest developments in that bombing in Oklahoma City. Well, tonight, a very young bank robber is on the loose. Bill Youngkin tells us about him in his exclusive Crime Stopper report. I'm Bill Youngkin. A March 30th bank job here in Fairview Park could have been a gang initiation. I'll have the full story in my exclusive Crime Stopper report coming up in a few minutes. As we've been telling you, there are new leads tonight in the Oklahoma City bombing. Reporter Mike McKee has the latest from the nation's capital. At the White House, President Clinton opened a state arrival ceremony for the president of Brazil by asking for a moment of silence for the Oklahoma City victims. May God's grace be with them. As Mr. Clinton spoke, the resources of his government were being mobilized to help with rescue efforts at the bomb site and to conduct a worldwide search for those responsible. U.S. officials have concluded the bombing was a terrorist attack, though they do not yet know who was behind it. Problems, the president like cautioned race. against jumping to conclusions, to but again Congress promised swift, anyway. certain, and severe justice. And there is no place to hide. Nobody can hide any place in this country, nobody can hide any place in this world from the terrible consequences of what have been done. Acting on information from U.S. authorities, the British intercepted a man carrying a U.S. passport arriving at Heathrow Airport 
and returned him to the United States. His intended destination and nationality were not immediately known. The president, however, hinted at the possibility of military action if it turns out a foreign government is involved. Make no mistake about it, this was an attack on the United States, our way of life and everything we believe in. That way of life has clearly been affected. Security guards are now searching purses and parcels at commercial buildings throughout the country and federal facilities around the world. The president ordered extra precautions taken at federal daycare centers and flags flown at half-staff through Monday. And our live coverage of the Oklahoma City Blast will continue tonight at 6 o'clock. A bank robbery in Fairview Park by a guy who appeared hardly old enough to drive a getaway car. In his exclusive Crime Stopper report, Bill Yonkin says police have an interesting theory about this case. It was lunchtime. Four customers were inside the Society Bank branch on March 30th. Then a young man walks in, a young bank robber. This is a bank security camera picture of the suspect police are looking for. He may be young, but he was calm and cool. Apparently he was going to head over toward the merchant window, which is in a little more secluded area. And one of the tellers said, may I help you? And he walked over to her window, handed, him the, handed her the note. She complied. He turned around and walked right back out. He wrote in the note that he had a gun. If he had one, he never pointed it at anyone. He wasn't in the bank long enough. A minute at best. According to the times on our camera, he was in here for about a minute. Police say he walked out a side door and vanished in a packed parking lot. Investigators here in Fairview Park have an interesting theory in this case. They believe that this March 30th bank job may have been a gang initiation. In fact, they've even been checking around high schools for the suspect. It might have been some form of initiation, maybe to get in a gang because of the way he was dressed and maybe perform some kind of crime to get into a gang. This is that bank security camera picture of the suspect. Now, here's a police composite drawing of the same man. He's black with light skin in his late teens, standing 5'6 to 5'8 and weighing 150 pounds. If you have any information, call the Crime Stoppers hotline at 252-7463. You could get a cash reward of up to $2,000. That's 252-7463. For Crime Stoppers, I'm Bill Yunkin, News Channel 5. Again, Crime Stoppers pays a cash reward to anyone with information about a serious crime, and all information is kept confidential. Cleveland Mayor Michael White and his driver stop a woman in her tracks for dumping her car ashtray on Public Square. Details when Live on 5 returns. Mayor Michael White adds another duty to his mayoral responsibilities, busting litter bugs. The mayor says he caught a Lorraine woman in the act of littering. But was she? News Channel 5's Michael Satoni went to Lorraine for her side of the story. Is Mary Short a litter bug? Nothing but ashes in here. When Mary cleaned her ashtray by dumping her ashes on Public Square, Mayor Michael White was in his mayor's car at the same stoplight and caught her in the act. White's driver called the cops, and Short's got this $85 ticket for littering. I think his intentions were honorable. I just think someone was mistaken as to what was thrown out of the car. Maybe they saw the silver of the ashtray and assumed it was a piece of a bubblegum wrapper or chewing gum wrapper or whatever. The alleged crime happened right here in front of the Old Stone Church, littering. 61302. Now, the mayor and his chauffeur are both out of town on vacation this week, but according to the mayor's office, when the chauffeur saw Mary dump her ashes, he rolled down his window and said, You don't do that in Lorraine, do you? Mary says that she's worked here in downtown for 15 years and always makes it a point to dispose of her butts properly. And I know what it's like to walk down the middle of a street and it, it looked, you know, nasty from garbage and litter and, and everything else. And I don't. I don't keep my yard like that, and I don't expect Cleveland to keep theirs that way either. Mary's due back in court May 3rd. She's hired a lawyer and plans to fight the ticket because according to Mary, dumping a few ashes on the street doesn't make you a litter bug. Michael Satoni, News Channel 5. Now this, by the way, is not the first mayoral bust. Remember when he caught those drug dealers a few years back? His honor could, by the way, be called to testify if this case goes to trial. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday evening. Our live team coverage on the Oklahoma City Blast continues with News Channel 5 at 6. Good night.
There's a possible break in the investigation in the Oklahoma City bombing. Arrest warrants are issued and one man is returned to the U.S. as rescue workers continue searching for survivors. A 10-year-old Akron girl upset by the bombing gets her school to help the victims. And sixth graders on a field trip end up in the hospital after their tour buses are in an accident. News Channel 5 at 6 is straight ahead. Channel 5, Cleveland's live 24-hour news source continues. Further investigation has determined that two white males were associated with this vehicle. As a result, arrest warrants will be sought for these two males. It is a very big break in the Oklahoma City bombing case. The FBI is now looking for two white males they believe are responsible for the blast that has so far killed 36 and injured more than 400. Good evening. It's a lead in the case investigators were hoping would come their way. But the FBI isn't limiting its investigation just yet. For the very latest on this story, we go to News Channel 5's Joe Paganakis, who joins us in the Satellite Center. And Joe, what can you tell us about these two suspects? Well, Lorna, investigators believe the two white males that they're looking for rented a Ryder minivan from Junction City, Kansas, of all places. As a matter of fact, the rear axle from that very van was found two blocks from the blast site. Investigators also believe that they rented the van and used an alias in this case. Now, here are those suspects, once again, both white males in their early 20s, 5'10 in height, one weighing in at about 180 pounds with light brown hair and a crew cut the other with a tattoo on his lower left arm. Now, despite this big development, the FBI is keeping its search for other suspects wide open. We are going to pursue every lead. We are excluding no lead. We have received information from a variety of sources concerning a variety of leads, and we will continue to pursue every lead. Attorney General Janet Reno says all escape routes out of the country have been closed. 200 FBI agents have been brought in to search for the two white males believed to have rented the van that carried the 1,200-pound bomb. And a man described as a witness arrested at London's Heathrow Airport today is now being returned to the United States for questioning. Still, despite these developments, experts say it still resembles a Middle Eastern terrorist attack. It's clear that they used certain methods which were used in the Middle East. I mean, using a car bomb, putting it in front of a building, and maybe implanting in the building itself. But President Clinton stressed the investigation should be kept open despite earlier reports that two men of Middle Eastern descent were also being sought. And we should not stereotype anybody. What we need to do is to find out who did this and punish them harshly. And that's the latest at this hour. The death toll officially still remains at 36, Lorna. But, of course, as we've been telling you all along, that's expected to get much larger. And I want to stress at this time that despite these developments, no one, no one has been arrested at this hour. They're still searching for those two men. All right, Joe Pagan, from our Satellite Center. Thank you. Dead. Absolutely heartbreaking disasters like this one have a way of bringing people together, of course. People would rather dig in and do whatever they can to make things better. News Channel 5's Barbara Meek joins us now from our Akron Bureau with such a story tonight. Barbara, what interests me here is how young folks are getting involved mm. with this one. Yes, they are. In this case, they're little kids with big hearts and a big idea. Ten-year-old Christina Canzoni of Macedonia couldn't stand to just sit by idly and watch all the horrible scenes on TV. She just had to do something, so she did. I just didn't know how anyone could do that. Christina Canzoni couldn't believe what she was seeing on television yesterday. Injured children were being carried out of a collapsed and shredded building. I think what caught her attention was a lot of the blood. And she said, Mom, is that blood? And I said, yes. And she said, I'd like to donate blood. I'd like to give my blood to help these people. And I said, well, honey, you're too small. Uh, they won't let you. And she said, well, I have $5. Well, $5 help. Can I send my $5? Christina then asked if there's anything else she could do, and her mom suggested raising money. Well, she called me with the idea. Christina called her best friend, Scarlett Young, about organizing a school fundraiser for the people in Oklahoma City. Scarlett loved the idea. Because I just didn't want them to, like, have nothing, and I wanted them to, like, have something to look up to so they have something. So this morning, they marched into the principal's office, the man they call Mr. V. Oh, and I said, I think it's a great idea. Let's do it. 
Christina and Scarlett then wrote up some notes asking their classmates to bring extra money to school. And every day for the next week, they'll collect it while kids buy their supplies at the bookstore. The girls will give the money to the Red Cross, which they hope will be able to use the donation to ease more people's pain. That they'll like help the people and a lot of hospitals will help out to try to help the people that are still like living, but they have like a few problems. Now, the school has turned the girls' fundraising idea into a competition. The school and the student council have each contributed $100. The principal is now challenging the kids to match that amount. Barbara, what a great story. The girl's mother must be awfully proud of those youngsters. They really are. Christina's mom told me she likes the way her daughter was able to see a disaster and turn it into something positive. Constructive for all of us, mm -hmm. isn't it? Barbara Meek from Akron, thank you. Mm -hmm. An Akron woman is heading to Oklahoma to find out what happened to her brother. Teresa Tomlin says her brother Rick was in the building when it exploded yesterday morning. She says his wife was on the phone with him when it happened. And today, Teresa, her husband, and their little boy, boy boarded a plane heading there in hopes he's still alive. Well, hopefully my brother's okay. And he'll, you know, my two-year-old will get to see and grow up with his uncle, but otherwise my two-year-old will not know my brother. Now we've been checking the injured and deceased list and have yet to come across Rick Tomlin's name. Among the hundreds of workers helping the injured in Oklahoma are three paramedics from Lyndhurst. David Young, Michael Carroll, and Daniel Isaac by name. They all arrived in Oklahoma City to help provide medical assistance and relieve paramedics who are working virtually around the clock. The Lyndhurst fire chief says that he had no problem whatsoever approving their mission of mercy. I, I came in after lunch and they said, hey, we want to uh, go out and help these people and do whatever we can. And he said, we've contacted the Red Cross out there. They said they needed paramedics. And um, they, they called Southwest Airlines. They donated the, the tickets, round trip tickets to Oklahoma City. So who's going to be picking up their slack now? Well, Sweeney says other paramedics have volunteered to fill in for the trio. Well, if you want to offer your help to victims of the Oklahoma explosion, the Red Cross will gladly take your phone call. Although there is no need for blood at this time, Red Cross officials say there are plenty of services that do need funding. Money is really the best thing. Um, the, what money is used for is to help the Red Cross pay for the first aid treatment that we're setting up. We have shelters in place for families right now who are worried about their loved ones. They have a place to go and wait. Um, we have mass care, which means feeding. Now, if you would like to donate money for the Oklahoma relief effort, call the Red Cross at 431-3083. Somebody, for some kooky reason, decided this would be a good time to phone in a bomb scare into the Lake County Courthouse. Sure enough, they did it last night, just around 1.40 in the morning. A message was left on the answering machine at the building in Painesville. It said, three bombs are in the courthouse to go off at 10 o'clock. Please evacuate. We don't want to hurt anybody. Sure enough, the building was evacuated, but thank goodness no bombs were found. However, if the cops catch the caller, he could be going to jail. Authorities are not taking any chances when it comes to security at federal buildings. Federal guards were searching bags and boxes as folks entered the federal building in downtown. Now, there have been no threats against the Cleveland office, but the tighter security will remain in place. Federal workers say the bombing in Oklahoma is all anyone can talk about. I was thinking about about 9 o'clock this morning. As if we get through 9 o'clock, maybe we'll be okay. So, And we did, but I don't think about it all day. This is tight security inside, and uh, to me, I think it's very much a shame that uh, the United States and here in Cleveland that uh, we have to have this such tight security in the United States. Security has been heightened at all federal facilities. We are a nation in mourning tonight. Flags all across Cleveland, and for that matter, the whole country, are flying at half-staff. This evening, President Clinton ordered the flags to be lowered to mourn the victims of the explosion in Oklahoma City. In his proclamation statement, President Clinton says the victims were brutally bombed in an appalling act of cowardice. He promises again, those responsible will be brought to total justice. And still ahead, we will go live to Oklahoma City for the latest in the bomb investigation and the rescue efforts. And several kids are injured when their tour buses get into an accident. We'll tell you how the kids are doing as News Channel 5 continues.
search and rescue is the mission of the day in Oklahoma City today. And hopes that those missing in the rubble of the federal building are somehow still alive. Reporter Judy Fortin joins us right now, live from the bombing site in Oklahoma City. Judy, is there a chance of finding still more survivors, do you think? Well, Ted, they haven't given up yet. There are literally hundreds of rescue crews here on the scene, doctors and nurses still standing by. We've been watching an interesting event develop right behind us uh, at the bombing scene at the building. We can show you a live picture now. There is a red crane that you can see moving away from the building. It uh, has been containing a basket, and they've had rescue personnel, uh, firefighters, as well as structural engineers and experts going through each of the floors to see if the building is structured sound. Uh, during this afternoon, they've had to uh, slow down on rescue efforts while they check to make sure the building is safe. Oklahoma's insurance commissioner said a short while ago that new cracks were found in the basement of the building, and that is sure to hamper rescue efforts. They uh, want to make sure that if there is anyone alive, they find those people soon because these folks are going to need some medical attention. Uh, hopes are dimming, but uh, they haven't given up yet, Ted, of uh, finding someone alive in this building. And uh, the last time they did uh, hear from anyone in Polk someone out was last evening around 10 o'clock central time when they found a 15 year old girl alive in the building and she we understand is in the hospital fighting for her life at this hour back judy, to you judy you say the hopes are dimming this is one point i don't quite understand yet because uh, throughout the years as you and i know and many other people know survivors have been uh, uncovered from uh, rubble nine and ten days after buildings have collapsed because of earthquakes and other explosions of that nature why couldn't that also be the case here well, they're still keeping at it, Ted. They haven't given up yet, but the extent of the damage here, so many of the bottom floors are sandwiched together. They're afraid that people have literally been crushed in all of the rubble. Uh, we know the daycare center was on the second floor, and uh, earlier we heard one of the uh, rescue uh, workers here said that it's the bottom three or four floors that have suffered extensive damage. They just can't get to any of those who were trapped Judy, there, Ted. what's the mood, briefly, of the people of Oklahoma City? I know it was shock and disbelief and grief at first. Has it turned yet to anger? It has turned to anger for a lot of people. They don't know why this has happened. These are their friends, their loved ones. And even if the people don't know, uh, those are the victims who are involved, they just can't help feel the hurt and the sorrow for these people. This is a city that's truly in despair right now. They don't know why this has happened. They don't know if it's safe to go down the street. There were more bomb threats earlier today, Ted, and these people are scared. Judy, thank you very much. Judy Ford reporting for us live from Oklahoma City. Thank you. In other news, it was supposed to be an educational visit to Cleveland's rainforest. Instead, busloads of Pennsylvania school kids got an education in the emergency room. Three buses carrying them from Erie rammed on the shoreway this morning. 27 sixth graders were treated and released from Metro Health Medical Center. Police say the accident happened after a truck changed lanes, forcing a car driven by former Browns running back Greg Pruitt to slam on his brakes in front of the first bus causing a chain reaction. I fell through three seats. What happened to you? Uh, I have a deep knee bruise this side and that side, and a little fracture right here. Well, the uninjured students spent the day at the fire department training academy. The Cleveland Red Cross says it is playing it safe by withdrawing a limited quantity of blood from area hospitals. The blood collected between January of 93 and April of this year may have passed through some malfunctioning screening equipment used to detect hepatitis B. 59 area hospitals served by the Red Cross have returned the blood. And the Red Cross medical director is confident the blood supply right now this is safe. This is one out of four tests that we do to detect hepatitis. So there are several other tests that if there is any chance that one could have been uh, positive, we would detect with the others. And the worry, of course, is now totally over. The Red Cross assures us the machine used to detect hepatitis was corrected. Well, remember when Mayor Michael White nabbed those drug dealers a few years back? Well, he's at it again, this time a litter bug. Mary Short says all she did was dump the ashes from her ashtray onto the street in front of the Old Stone Church. No cigarette butts, just the ashes. Now, the mayor was in his car right next to her and called the cops. Mary got this $85 ticket for littering, but she's going to fight it. So one thing I don't quite understand, if she only dumped the ashes, what did she do with the butts? Good question. We'll have to ask her. <laughs> There's definitely a chill in the air tonight, but how long is it going to last? Don Webster's forecast is next.
Ted, I don't know if you saw it earlier, but Don has a five-day forecast that's pretty nice. It's a killer? It's a killer. I want to see it. Is that good, huh? Because yesterday's, it wasn't so hot for the next four or five days. It's better. Well, I've had better five-day forecasts, mm -hmm. but compared to those we've had lately, yeah. this one's pretty good. See, okay. everything is relative, Ted. <laughs> Let's right? see it. Everything is relative. Some big storms on our national weather map as we have a look at our national radar. And most of that uh, heavy weather is up and down the Mississippi River Valley, and they have a lot of tornado watches in effect right now. I'll show you those in a minute or two. But uh, you can see that big band of showers that has developed down there. We've had one little band come through here, gave us a little bit of rain earlier today. Right now, just cloudy skies, nothing too much happening, but a little bit later on tonight, there's a real good chance that uh, we'll have some showers and probably some thunderstorms late this evening or uh, up around midnight. On next red Doppler radar, you can see the first band of showers that came through, and after that, it's all cleared out. Nothing coming in from the west right now, but as I said, a little bit later on, we'll in all probability see some things start to develop uh, down to the southwest. Our high today was uh, 52 degrees so far. Uh, 41 was our low last night. Averages 60 and 39. Last year, 57 and 36. Record high was 83, set in 1985, and the record low 23, set in 1904. Uh, for the month so far, 12.03 inches of rain. We're about uh, 3.04 inches above normal for this time of year. I apologize that 52 didn't click into my computer, so you'll have to trust me. 52 is the number. 48 outside now. Humidity is 86 percent. Barometer 29.95. Winds are out of the northeast at 7 miles an hour. And around the state, you can see that everybody's in pretty good shape. 48 in Cleveland, 53 in Mansfield. Downstate, much warmer. Parkersburg coming in at 59. Down in Huntington, West Virginia, 67 degrees. Dayton, 64. Cincinnati, 70. And I think you can see this at home, just the edge of a watch box here in southern Indiana. And that is a tornado watch, in effect, in southern Indiana until 8 o'clock tonight. Nothing yet in Ohio, and hopefully we'll stay quiet tonight. We'll uh, keep a close eye on that for you, though. Here's what's happening. A couple of uh, systems. Number one is a warm front coming up. That's going to be passing through here very shortly. You saw that warmer air down uh, in the southern section of the state. But as this whole system moves to the northeast, it's triggering showers and thunderstorms. So the warm front will come through first, give us a very warm day tomorrow. Then it'll start to cool off a little bit. Here's what's going to happen over the next 24 hours. And that rain will get out of here quite quickly tomorrow morning. And we'll get back to partly sunny skies. I think we'll definitely have a nice sunset by tomorrow night and a pretty good weekend coming along, too. Severe weather now. You can see a lot of tornado watch all the way uh, from the Gulf of Mexico right up to southern Indiana. And uh, right now, this is our forecast. Showers and thunderstorms developing later. Winds out of the east coming to the south at 10 to 20, a low of 50. Early showers tomorrow, partly cloudy during the afternoon. Pretty nice day. A little bit on the windy side with winds coming to the west at 15 to 25. High temperature, about 70. Not a bad day at all. Here's our five-day for tomorrow, 70, and the rain ending by noon on Saturday, partly cloudy and 60. Whoa. Sunday, partly cloudy and 55. Monday, sunshine. Tuesday, sunshine. A little cooler, 55 and 56, but all in all, pretty good weekend coming up. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a great weekend coming up, <laughs> yeah. relatively Thanks, speaking. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Cold enough to be hockey night in Cleveland. Bob's next with a playoff preview live from the gun. And a big night in Florida for one of the tribe's important arms. Sports is next. Bob Stevens with big news of the tribe tonight, and bigger news is the tribe's going to play for real a week from, what, tomorrow? A week from tonight. A week from tonight. It's opening night of the wow. baseball season, Final and it'll night. almost be May. They won't have that April slump they always have That's because right. they won't start playing until <laughs> May, huh? Hey, you know how it is when you get a reputation? I mean, it just haunts you. Sandy Alomar is one tough cookie, but he gets hurt a lot. He swears his swollen knee is going to be okay. The Indians do too, but he has missed more than half of the tribe's games the last four years. He's missing a second straight preseason game tonight against the Tigers. No time to panic, but reputations are tough to shake. Big night tonight also for Charlie Nagy. He's making, finally making his spring training debut tonight, just a week before opening day. I mean, everybody's saying, you know, pitching's going to be the big question mark here, and I thought we held our own pretty well last year. And, uh, you know, but, you know, you got to prove yourself every year. And, uh... It's another year and yeah just another year nice touch from some of those greedy ball players today the kansas city royals players are donating ten thousand dollars to the oklahoma city disaster relief fund that's nice i was out playing golf today was i nuts it's hockey weather out there for the first time all year the lumberjacks have an advantage on their season they split two games in cincinnati game three of the five game series in no oh, a little more than half an hour lisa burkew joins us live from gundarina lease the jacks struggled in the regular season but come playoff time one player can turn a team around bob a hot goalie can make a difference it can make or break a series in fact last week coach rick patterson of the lumberjacks was sweating it out he didn't know whether his star goalie 
Philippe Deruva would be reassigned from Pittsburgh after a one-week stint there. Well, Patterson wasn't the only one relieved when the stopper was sent back down right before the playoff puck was dropped. Uh, sure, I would be disappointed. I mean, uh, to not be uh, to not be here for a playoff because I play all year here, and um, you know, it's kind. Of, I, I kind of felt bad a little bit to go to be called up and didn't know if I would be here for playoff, but. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here. You have to uh, play with a hand that's dealt you, and uh, uh, we weren't sure if we are going to get him back because of the, uh, the goaltender situation in Pittsburgh, so it was certainly a uh, relief. Such relief came in the form of 79 saves these last two playoff games. The Jacks earned a split in the two overtime games in Cincinnati, their first win there all year. And DeRuville thrives on those pressure situations. Well, he makes the big saves, uh, the timely saves. You know, uh, Cincinnati gets on a roll or they're on their power play when uh, they get some scoring chances, and he shuts them right down. Uh, like I always said, we're you know, money players. When it's important to win, uh, win games, we, we win it. So, uh, I mean, it just, uh, it's just good for me to be here, and uh, I hope it's going to work. Well, a lot of Lumberjacks fans here tonight, Bob, hoping it work, will work as well. Hopefully they'll wrap it up in two games here at home and won't have to go back to Cincinnati. There you go. All right, thanks, Lise. Sure. Uh, we'll have more tonight on the Jacks at 11. Hey, Cavs have been full of amazing stories this season, haven't they? But, man, last night's was really one of the best. John Battles played just a handful of minutes all year, but the Cavs were desperate for a spark off the bench, and so Battle comes in, drills 10 points in the second quarter, finishes with 17 points in 18 minutes. If this is Battle's swan song at age 32, it was a sweet refrain. And then we bring him back suddenly, just say, you know, can you go, can you suit up? He said, yeah. And then we put him in a position that's not even his natural position. And he, you know, responds the way he did. My son said he didn't, he doesn't see me on the court anymore. And I had to, I had to try and get him some more minutes. These are his minutes I'm playing right now. <laughs> That's nice. Cavs and Hawks each have two games left. Both will be favored at home on Friday. Underdogs on the road on Saturday. The Cavs only need to win one to clinch the sixth spot. We'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Sure. We'll be right back. And there is much more coming up on News Channel 5 at 11. Tonight, they are wanted men. We will have the very latest on the search for two suspects in the Oklahoma City bombing. Also coming up tonight, Dr. Ted Trustell will be here. He's going to tell us how a trip to the dentist might save you from suffering a stroke. Those stories plus much more tonight at 11. And finally tonight, there were some cool sounds coming from Cleveland Hopkins Airport today. A noontime ceremony kicked off this year's Tri-C Jazz Fest. And our very own Nui Scruggs was there keeping the beat. Several big-name artists are in town to perform, including Latin jazz performance Steve Touré and Maddie, Manny Aquindo. If you're interested in attending one of the many Jazz Fest concerts, call Tri-C at 987 4400. You said Steve's name just right. Thanks for the lesson. I said go one more time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you did it fine. That's all for News Channel 5 tonight at 6 o'clock. World News Tonight is next. See ya. These are now the nation's two most wanted men. The FBI says they rented the truck that carried the bomb that blew up in Oklahoma City. A man detained in London, described as a witness, is returned to the U.S. Authorities want to talk to him about the contents of his luggage, which was checked to Jordan. And the dangerous job of searching for survivors. None were found today. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with the search for survivors in Oklahoma City and the search for the bombers. From the twisted wreckage of the federal building today, the news has not been encouraging. The structure is so unstable that rescue workers are in constant danger of being buried if parts of the building collapse even further. 36 bodies have been recovered. Other bodies are still inside, but no one was found alive today. In the search for those responsible, there have been significant developments. The FBI says it has identified the truck that carried the explosives and has descriptions of the men who rented it. Here's ABC's John McCrethy. ABC News has learned that this is where the truck was